Before we begin, a couple announcements. One, sorry it took a bit to get this uploaded to you guys, but I don't know what happened, whether I had pink eye or something, but my left eye was super sensitive and certain lights were affecting it that it, I felt a bit under the weather, but I'm doing better now so I can get this recorded. Uh, second thing, I have been in contact with my sister. She's sort of my uh, consultant kind of on these sort of things, her and her boyfriend, uh, Robin. They're a bit more kind of tech savvy in this area, which is a bit humbling. And they have advised me that uh, in this sort of world, tech world that we're in right now, certain videos of a certain length might be a bit easier for you guys. And so they have advised me a good benchmark, like videos of like 30 minutes or less, you know, like, like less than that would be better so that you have a better chance of you being able to stick around and watch them. I mean, I personally enjoy, you know, making like this, you know, big, you know, hour or hour and a half long videos, but you know, you know, they have made the point, you know, like, you know, that seems to be like a bit of a bigger pill to swallow. So hopefully for your enjoyment and hopefully it makes it easier on me because that's less editing time for me uh, in the editing room there. So hopefully that'll make it uh, more enjoyable for everybody. All right. I think with announcements out of the way, let us begin. All right. I guess I should address the elephant in the room is that this, you probably noticed something a bit different about this uh, video during the intro and there's something missing because I'm not have, wearing my uh, white uh, gambeson. Well, that is one thing, but something else is that I am not actually in front of my bookshelves. I know they looks like it, but no. Of course, I have no idea how it looks like on the screen for you. It was quite obvious because I'm still working this out, but I'm in front of a blue screen right now. Let's go take it out of the way. Yep, that's it. Got it right there. I got my two lights right there, so they're casting shadows because I have to figure this stuff out. Trying to make it, that was a whole thing trying to figure this, you know, I'm making it a whole blank set so I can chroma key it out, but hey, hopefully figure it out. So, first blue screen video. Hey, look at that. So, let's, uh, let's bring it back right now. Actually, because we know it's a, it's a Ranger video, so maybe spice it up a bit. Can we get some, uh, maybe some, some woodlands here, so maybe some trees and whatnot. Oh, there we go. How about that? Looks good, huh? Yeah. Robin to the little John walking through the forest. Do the lolly, do the lolly, golly, what a day. <laughs> uh, by the way, I uh, do how to make a point about talking about Robin Hood, but that might encompass a whole n separate video. We're talking about the Ranger here. I should probably preface this and say that most of the information that I'm about to present here, uh, I am getting from records of medieval England. I know that I have stated that you know my area of interest and stuff that the topics that I want to discuss about I want to talk place in medieval Germany, the central Germanic regions there during medieval uh, the medieval period 1000 to 1400. But uh, right now most of the stuff that I've gleaned from is comes from medieval England. So can we extrapolate somewhat? Say so if it was similar there, could it be possible the same in Germany? It's possible. I don't think it's safe to say that just because it was like this in England, well, is it must have been exactly the same in Germany. No, I don't think so. But, you know, it's. I think it's a fun topic to discuss, and I'm sure we can have like, some ideas that it could have been similar in different regions at the same time. But anyway, back to England here. The time frame in which the we have certain royal forests and have what we call forest law does not come about until around 1066. That should be an important date for for everyone during the medieval period. That is a time when William the Conqueror came over to England in his Norman conquest, or Norman invasion, depending on who you talk to, how they view the event. And when he came over and established the new ruling elites, he had a certain fondness of, shall we say, a big enthusiast of the hunt and like the royal chase, you know. So he set aside certain areas that we, ever, that we called royal forests that were kind of sort of off-limits zones that would like the, only the king and his sort of no, noble class could be able to partake in sort of like animals that were sort of protected under there. And I should also mention that while it goes by the name royal forest, that doesn't necessarily mean that it was actual forest. It could be, you know, grassland. It could be for, for pasture. It could be marsh, wetlands. It could be forest. You know, like there was many different types of land area in the sort of 
uh, of England and Wales right there that didn't necessarily be completely all trees and forest, you know, right and dense there. But it goes by the name because royal wetlands, royal marshes, royal grassland doesn't really have like a good ring to it right there. But royal forest, that sounds cool. So we'll stick with that. I have no idea if that's what, have, but that, that's what happened. They just stuck with the name royal forest. But so we have these certain areas that were set apart by the noble elites that came over there. So not maybe to be specifically, you know, William himself, but certain insert no, noble title here that decided that, hey, they want to separate off this particular certain area for their use and they want to protect the, the the animals and maybe even like the vegetation, the resources inside. So not only do they have do we decree that it is, you know, a certain zone is particularly uh, set, set off there, but now, you know, you have to enforce that particular, you know, decree right there. So you need to have people and, you know, organizations there to help enforce, you know, establish what exactly are the rules, what happens if you break them, what exactly are the stipulations of the rules, how do you acquire, you know, like a pass on certain things, you know, like what do you do? And oh boy, did that lead me down a rabbit hole of all these different things. So get ready, folks. Here we go. So as the king or noble class, sets apart these certain areas of royal forest that they sort of, they sort of need uh, people and organization and rules to help enact and protect the, the forest that they've set apart. And these group were known as the foresters. And it gets really confusing because the, kind of like how we have in sort of our businesses and the job descriptions that we have, is that we sort of have like main officers and CEOs like up at the top and we have like supervisor, manager levels kind of in the middle who get their orders from them and they give uh, the sort of understand to down to the like basic employee level right there. So they have like sort of like rungs in the ladder of the, the corporate ladder, shall we say, seem to work back then. And we have the top of the rung known as foresters. Not only the group known as the foresters, but we have a specific group of people of, of that group known as foresters. Then we have the middle rung known as foresters in fee. And then we have the bottom rung known as under foresters. Thankfully that they have a, a different set of words and terminology for these people. So those are the ones that I'm going to be going with just to make it easier on you and easier on me. So talking, going back to the top of the rung, the foresters, they might also go by the name of verderers. Uh, these guys, like I said, were probably like, these were the main officers type in charge who either got together to write down like the main rules, either handed from the king or they were had jurisdiction enough that they could write it themselves, that they were in charge of making the, the final say. The chief officer was the warden. Because, you know, one guy eventually has to be the one to make the final decision. That guy was the warden and he was in charge of the verderers. And so he basically had the final say to let go down to the foresters in fee or as we, some might call them, wood words. That happened to be the name that they have right there. Uh, they were in charge of their certain bailiwick. That is the term that they would describe what they have. Uh, if you're people who know about castle design, so let's say we have like the main uh, castle tower right here, and we have like the wall around it. Everything inside that wall section is sometimes referred to as the bailey. So it seems like this kind of word was common that, you know, these woodwards have their bailiwicks, these sort of like miniature baileys, you know, obviously not as grand as like a castle with walls or anything, but you know, like their sort of mini territory, they have their boundaries set there. Uh, they were sort of like in charge of like their little areas and had people under them that also reported them as well. Uh, ironically, the term woodward, woodward, the name for the bailey, going back to our castle, it was the inside of the wall section, the bailey also go with by the name of ward. So I'm going to have these names like wood words or wood ward that it seems in specifically in the name that it seems like they have these particular areas set apart of the wood of the royal forest. Again, it doesn't necessarily have to be forest. It could be grassland, marsh, peat bog, actual forest or whatever, whatever happened to be set apart that they seem to have like their particular territory. 
their job and as written from the article I read they seem to held they held land in exchange for rent so guessing to be it seems to be like sort of like a miniature landlord type of position where they had like their I don't know whether they actually owned the land right there or they were just like particular in charge of it where like the king owned everything when they were like in like at least like in charge of that particular area and so they had like they had to report up every all the dealings in their particular area where they, instead of like having like say the warden or the verderer in charge of everything to have to do it himself he goes down to like woodwards so that they have their smaller sections that they're in charge of you know makes sense and makes it easier for everybody and then we go down to the uh, final rung the under foresters or as later known as rangers these are the guys that were out and about making sure that they were in the fields or in the forest whatever they may be at and patrolling the purlieu as it is called the patrollers of purlieu as the, the name i'm hoping i'm pronouncing that correctly it's spelled like this what exactly is the purlieu the purlieu again sorry for my pronunciation if that's wrong but it's sort of like the fringe area from where the township, the main populace, the buildings and where everything is, before it touches the actual, like, say, forest, shall we say. There's a sort of, like, gray area of, like, where, so we have, like, the, the civiliz civilization part right there. Then we have sort of, like, the area of, like, say, pasture land, which is probably where we're most of, like, the cattle grazing and whatnot. Then we have the actual forest, like, kind of beginning, shall we say. And this sort of like fringe area, this little gray section right here, that's known as the purlieu. And these rangers were known as the patrollers of the purlieu. So what exactly do these rangers do as they're going about their job? Uh, they are not specifically just the rangers themselves, but you know, the foresting group in general that we call the foresters, are said to protect the vert and venison. You probably figure out what these names mean, but the venison, being the meat of the deer, they were supposed, under the stipulation of venison, they were to make sure that certain animals were protected and not hunted uh, by certain people in the time frame, not specifically deer itself. But we do know that the not only the deer, but also the boar, the hare, which is kind of like a, basically like a rabbit, for those of you who don't know, and oddly enough, the wolf. For some reason was protected under there that the I guess for hunting purposes that there's some thrill of going after that some great predator right there but these specific animals as probably sure as some others at some point were had the protection under you know under forest law that these people had like they were not be able to touch them or if they did they had to have certain access or permission to hunt them and we'll get into like the rules and stipulations of what when or what they could hunt later. The so the that's part takes part of the venison side. Then what is the vert? So we have the animals of the forest. Then what else could possibly be? For those of you who don't know, vert is the word of the color green that they used back then. Like we have terms of like red, green, yellow, blue, purple. They have also have different names for colors and. Their color for green was vert. So, so just as a little uh, fun fact here, go back take my little shield that I have here. Uh, I did put the uh, green on here first, and let's say that this is simple as you know, like a red cross on a green background. So this would be a gul cross on vert. These are the names that they would use for the, uh, their colors that they had. So gul was red and vert was green. So you can probably understand that when they are talking about protecting the vert and venison, so they are in charge of protecting the animals under their care and basically anything that falls within the, the greenery of the forest. It doesn't necessarily have to be like the trees itself. It could be like a certain shrub or bush, a vine, a flower, whatever that the king or noble class says like, hey, these are under our protection. You must have certain permission from us to go ahead and take use of these materials being vert or venison, shall we say. Now these uh, rangers and the foresting group in general, in order to help sort of understand what the, was, was going on and make sure all the rules are in place, they were supposed to have their meetings 
on every, what they call the 40 days of attachment, uh, also known as wood moat, which is the term that I'm going to be using for this. And it was said that they were to meet once every two fortnights. Of course, we don't know a fortnight is 20 days, so in two fortnights would be 40, so hence the 40 days of attachment. And, as you know, like 40 days is kind of basically like their, their monthly meetup, shall we say, of being able to touch base, see where things are going at, and so see what the new rules are, how things are going. So, picking purely random dates here, uh, let's start with the beginning of the year. Let's pick uh, January 10th, all right? So, January 10th, the new year has come around. January 10th arrives and say like, hey, everyone's here. New year was great. How was it going? You did have a good time? Uh, I know the snow has kind of been pretty bad. Our stocks are doing fairly good. The harvest was good last year. These are kind of the plans that we're hoping to do this year as opposed to last year. So, meeting is adjourned. Then they would go on to the next one. So, in rough terms, bear with me here, assuming that each month has 30 days in it. I know some have 30, some have 31. One particular month seems to have only 28. But in broad pictures, assuming that everyone has 30 days, it'll make it easier to count in, in the number system that I have here. So from January 10th, the next one in line would be February 20th. They would meet up and have their meetings. So I'm like, all right, hey, see, how's it going? It seems like the snow is melting. All right, here's what the idea is. It looks, looks like everything's going in place. Meeting adjourned, go to the next one, which would be from February 20th, be March 30th. Instead of trying to explain all of them, we're just going to go ahead and put all of them right here now. And so, apologize for April, August, and December. Uh, you don't get one, apparently, because, you know, there's that 40 days of a span where the certain months get missed. So, sorry, guys. So, why did I pick these particular dates here? Well, because of Swain Moat. Now, what is that, you might ask? Well, uh, I gotta go tell my little cheat sheet here. Swain Moat was held three times per year. And it was held around the Feast of St. John the Baptist, a fortnight before the Feast of St. Michael, also my people not know it as Michael Moss, and a fortnight before the Feast of St. Martin. And so what does that mean? Uh, I had to look up certain dates of what time or frame are. The time frame of the Feast of St. John the Baptist is June 24th around that time. Seems to be pretty close to our basic round dates that we have here. The Feast of St. Michael takes place around September 29th. But as I said, they took a bit about a fortnight before the Feast of, of St. Michael or Michaelmas. Well, if it's the 29th, we take the fortnight 20 days off, it becomes September 9th which coincides pretty close to that particular date in September, September 10th. And the Feast of St. Martin is typically seen to be around November 11th. Then again, it's the fortnight before, so if we take 20 days off of November 11th, we get October 22nd. Pretty darn close to there. Now again, can I say that these they happen to coincide with other certain wood boats? I would assume so. Because if there are people are certain people are coming together on these dates, you might as well have like, hey, since everyone's here, sway moat is adjourned here. Let's let's figure out the rules here. But again, can I say that these were the specific dates of everything? I mean, we kind of have ideas of what sway moat was, but so do wood moat seem to be coincide? I think it does. But then again, don't know for sure of whether they can so coincide with wood moat with sway moat, or if these were separate dates where. Wood mode was completely on a different schedule, and sway mode they adjourned at different times just for those ones again. Again, I don't know, but I just find it interesting that I could, in these particular dates that I put out, it happens to coincide very well with wood mode, which I would assume people would say put sway mode in there as well. But I'm just, I'm just letting you the information that I have figured out here. And so you may ask exactly what is sway mode? Sway mode is the Rules and Rites of Panage, or Panage, it, it's spelled like this, and so yeah, I'm not 100% sure how you know, Panage, Panage, 
Again, sorry for the pronunciation of how it works. And it is specifically the rules and rights that people have on pasturing swine. Again, I don't, I don't know 100% sure whether we get, get that from that name, Swain Moat, because it kind of derivative of the word swine. So I don't know if that, that does have if the correlation of that word being in use and Old English being translated becomes swine to Swain Moat. Again, I don't know. Or if it's just a completely different word, but I just happen to know that they sound similar. But the rules and regulations of pasturing pigs in the royal forest, shall we say. I find it interesting that it happens to be, as I said right here, in June, September, and October. And some of the rules for pasturing pigs was the rule or the guidelines of rooting that they needed to have suspicions of when rooting was possible and what was possible. What is rooting? Uh, rooting is a term for a kind of kind of specifically pigs as well, but sort of in a way of like soft tilling of the land, where uh, land as it's kind of like uh, in, as the months and years go by kind of settles and sort of like packs down a little bit, and you kind of need to help like churn it up a little bit to make it more fertile, as like if you're wanting to plant things in for 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 the, for the crops, and what they would do is that if the people had herds of pigs, well then they would kind of like let them loose in these certain areas and with their little hooves and snouts, they would kind of like kind of churn up the earth a little bit. And so they would sort of like get the earth ready, but also this rooting of the ground, you know, turning it up for, for making the land fertile, would also, because they're rooting around for acorns. Acorns be the second half of the panage, panage, because it is a great way to help fatten the pigs quickly for slaughter. Because I don't know if you know, uh, nuts are very calorically dense. And if you just chow down on those, I'm like, you can gain quite a lot of fat and mass very quickly. I have done that before, and I was not proud of that. And so it serves quite like a dual purpose right here. It's helping the ground and is getting the pigs ready for the time of the season because, you know, winter is approaching. You know, whatever pigs we have don't really last through winter, so whatever we have, fatten them up and then uh, uh, kill them and then have the meat prepared to uh, serve during the winter. The odd fact that I happen to look up is that I happen to, in Google, I happen to type in the search, you know, when do acorns fall? And oddly enough, it shows that acorns seem to be the falling around September and October. And so of our two uh, swain moat dates that we have right here, the September 10th and October 20th, it seems to make sense here. And they would have certain times where like the nuts have fallen down, uh, might as well, we're like we're ready for the winter, the snow is coming, let's get the pigs fattened up, let's get the ground ready. Uh, swain moat is like, okay, so uh, your pigs, you see, how many do you have? Like, you're, so you're allowed on this particular land and you, uh, you had trouble last time, so yeah, we need to fix the sort of fence so that they can keep in because, you know, you had a little problem last time, and so they would have these, like, rules of, like, how things would happen of the, again, sorry for pronunciation, panage, panage, of these, again, rules of, again, part of the, I guess you call it part of the venison rules of vert and venison, that these pigs would have certain rules and people would have rights of, to handle pigs in their sort of pasture land, all of these sort of weird things coinciding together to part of panage, panage, again, sorry for my pronunciation here. There is another uh, word that we have was called adjustment, which specifically handles other, it was primarily cattle, but it seems like also sheep were also included. So we have like, we have panage specifically for pigs, and then we have adjustment for cattle and the rules that they have for what time frames and how many people could go into grazing of those during the summer again. Again, oddly enough, they did not have particular, you know, moats in the wood moat section for cattle, only pigs, which kind of does make sense because pigs were the predominant uh, meat source of the common people. Pigs, as opposed to like having chickens or beef to eat, uh, oddly enough, uh, I did notice that chickens were kind of a little bit more up on the uh, higher 
uh, noble class that seems more of an uh, elevated, level. like that was a more fancier dish, shall we say. You know, we, in this area, we kind of find chickens quite common. And so the pigs and pork seem to be like a little bit above chicken right now for us, at least in my opinion, it seems. It seems like it was kind of a little bit the opposite. It was like pigs were the more uh, common meat and chickens were like a little bit above. And then, you know, cows, beast of burden, also mostly providing milk. You don't really just butcher it for the meat product. When it gets old, sure, you can kill it and then ha enjoy the beef there. But no, you you use every part of the buffalo here. This is like, like you use it for as a beast of burden. And if it's a milking cow, you use that. And then when it comes time that no longer able to you in those areas, well, then you can ha enjoy beef for a while now. So that was part of the... Uh, uh, venison part of the Veriton venison that people are supposed to protect right there and so now we have the Vert part of there are a couple different rules of there that we have of uh, that part right here uh, included are Estover, Turbury, and Assorte. And what these are is uh, we'll start with Estover uh, again I hope I'm pronouncing these correctly here but Estover is the rules and rights of the rule of collecting wood, whether it be for as a source of fuel for your homes, or if you're like you're in the craftsman or trade district, whether you're like as part of like making certain materials, like if you're a smithing, or like part of if you're like carpentry, or whatever, like for, like even for like for timber for a resource to build certain things, you had like a certain amount of timber that you must use, uh, you're allowed to have as well because timber is a very valuable resource in that. The use of like for like fencing also used to keep you know like okay so these are the sort of boundaries of where you're kind of going back to the venison side of panage or uh adjustment that you have like okay so this is your particular area for where your cattle or your pigs are able to graze like you need wood for your fencing so you would invoke the rights of estover to see like how much wood you need and if you needed more then you know it's particularly you probably have to go to like the court of the foresters and see like, hey, can I get like an appeal or an extension and say like, you know, uh, these, this is my case. Can I get more wood for this particular case? And they would see like if they were able to work around that. Turbury was the form of collecting uh, turf. Sort of like like the, the main uh, grass and kind of dirt layer up at the beginning that people can like, we kind of call it sod so in some places. Uh, the turf was sometimes used as like a fuel source or even something like as a building material that some people use for the houses. So there was rules on how much turf people could have because, you know, like if you have this uh, area of land right here you need, and you wanted to use some of it, you know, how much could you use? Because all of a sudden you're like cutting the entire grassland out. It's just this barren, bleak land, you know, like it would seem that there would be rules, you know, like how much could be, you know, cut up as well. And going back to peat again, peat is a particular special kind of resource that uh, the marshy kind of areas that not only is it a fuel source as well as turf, but it can be used if you have certain techniques and quite a bit of it that you can actually make salt out of it. So sometimes people might have like small businesses based on that of just how much turf then and turbery that they have access to that they're able to get of the peat right there. So if they feel that certain people who have like these businesses feel like certain people are collecting more than their share and encroaching on their business, they might have to again go talk to the foresters and see like how much what their rights are in the rules of turbery that they have as a business as opposed to the let's say a common resident. And the final one that we're talking about is assorting, which is the most grievous offense in the entire foresting rules and stipulations because we have turbery which is you know removing of you know t turf and sod we have uh estover which is the removing of branches or picking up dead limbs from the ground but we have a sorting which is the complete removal like <clears throat> if people needed to like clear a particular area of land whether for like a building or a particular area you need to like uproot the entire tree and remove all you know known areas to sort of build right there. And if you were caught, you know, uprooting the entire vegetation without the right permission or authorization, like you have just destroyed a certain particular area of land 
without permission and hence the greatest and most formal penalty enacted right there as opposed to like again we don't know exactly know what penalties place about how heavy fines or imprisonment or even torture I don't know I don't know if it's safe to use your imagination here but you know like the total removal of something that you know took years to be planted and grow over there that is now gone was considered the most grievous offense here known as assarting This is Levi coming to you post-editing this video, realizing that we have just passed the 30-minute mark. So I will try and keep this last bit of information as brief and succinct as possible as we wrap this up here. We have a couple last positions in the Forrester community. We have the Adjusters. The Adjusters were the ones who, you know, handled adjustment, but not so specifically of cattle explicitly. They sort of handled pretty much all uh, animal-related businesses, whether it be uh, cattle, pigs, or sheep, that they were sort of the people in charge who would handle pasturage of animals in the forest. We also have the surveyors. The surveyors were kind of as the name sort of implies. They had the job of figuring out where exactly the borders were, were at, so like this is where the, the township you know, started and ended. This is where, like, the forest may begin. Uh, one person's bailiwick may have jutted up against another person's bailiwick. Well, then, okay, what exactly are the boundaries in between them? The surveyor's position and job was to figure out where the boundaries were located. Uh, finally, we have the regarders, and it was their position and job to handle assarting. I guess because they held the forest in such high regard that the most grievous offense that was their job description to handle the case of assarting there. Uh, the last thing I guess I will say before wrapping this up is the, another date uh, of interest here is the Court of Justice seat. Whereas the uh, Swain Moat was kind of held uh, three times per year, the Court of Justice seat was held one time per three years. And it was sort of like the final court, shall we say, where the foresters, the, you know, veritabers, woodwards, adjusters, everyone would come together. They would have the final appeal. This is where, like, sentencing would be carried out if offenses were made. It was the, where the circuit judge, kind of like, it's called justice in air. And he would go out in his uh, tour, basically, of the different shires, bailiwicks and towns, counties and towns over there and he would preside over the, the court and he would have the final say and give the verdict there. All right, I believe that does it. This has been a, uh, a brief uh, summation of the foresters in medieval Europe, uh, specifically England, per se. This is, again, as I said, this is where the information that I got. Uh, this is the second time, by the way, of recording this. I filmed everything, got it edited, and wasn't quite exactly happy about how it turned out, so I decided to shoot the entire thing over again. So, there's that. Uh, hope it edited together okay. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something, like I did. I might have another video up uh, concerning specifically about the Ranger itself, so that might be fun. Look forward to that one. And, like the Ranger, we must always stay alert, because we never know just what we might find out there. So we must keep our senses sharp, and until next time, keep a watchful eye.